uh, one of the things that we get regularly and um, that uh, for people with long haul COVID particularly is this kind of um, uh, non-linear recovery process so that you know people will feel like they um, have, uh, have, have rested in their words and then um, they'll feel like they're building up the energy and then a couple of um, um, over a, a week maybe and then they'll go out and try some activity or they'll try a, a, even activities of daily living and um, Vincent you mentioned hoovering and such like and then a couple of days later they almost return right back to, to kind of baseline is this something that's familiar from other conditions that you um, have come across and if it is what kind of what would be the, the advice that you would um, uh, perhaps want to, uh, to present to, um, to people with this I think people get lulled into this false sense of I'm better and go back to normal activity, like hoovering is a normal activity. And it's really, um, this is a, a, a phrase that Julie uses with medicine, go low and slow, go back really gently. It might be hoover one room and then you, you're almost like an oil tanker. It's going to take you a long time to stop, a long time to turn around and get back to the beginning if you make a mistake or you've just over egged it a little bit. So just plan things like that in, right, I'm feeling great, I'm going to try something, but I'm only going to try one thing. Because if you try multiple things, you don't know what that one, you don't know what, which one of them was tip, the tip the balance. So if you can hoover one room and then you're fine for three or four days afterwards, quids in, you're right. Then you try, right, I'll try hoovering two rooms and it's that slow because the process of recovery particularly if you're using something like adrenaline to hoover, I'm hearing patients tell me, I get a high, I get a high from activity. So it masks how they're actually feeling. So take it slow and you almost have to try one thing, see how you go, all right, I can manage one room, right, next week I'll manage two, the week after I'll manage three, but not at the expense of, as, as Kate said, the pleasure aspect. Hoovering, well, some people might find hoovering pleasurable, but if you can find another aspect you know, I'm going to hoover one day, give it three days, and then I'm going to go out and have a coffee somewhere. That would be more, but it, that's how you have to pace. So that sounds like a pacing issue to me. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think yeah. It's, a, it's a matter of really kind of discovering what your new baseline is. Um, so if, for example, a healthy person has gone and had some major elective surgery, afterwards they might assume that they're going to be at that previous level of functioning beforehand and and then and then not you know they might attempt to unload the dishwasher and realize oh my goodness I, I'm really really struggling here and it's a similar thing I think with something like um post I, I imagine with post-covid fatigue as well because most people will have been fit and well beforehand they've been struck by this illness and now they're left with these this horrible persistent fatigue and and yet in their minds they're still potentially they might be back where they were before and think well I should be able to do it and then go and try something and then end up kind of with a huge setback really and it's a little bit like that boom and bust pattern that I was talking about so trying to find your new baseline level is a real skill and Vicky's just alluded to that it's really it's really difficult to find where that might be and it is a little bit of trial and error to start with but it is starting at a very low level and just seeing if if that's right for you and and if it is then great that's that's the foundation that you can slowly build on as I say but I suggested before building up in very slow increments um, rather than kind of pushing too hard too fast. Uh, I think the um, one of the other narratives that we're hearing is the it's almost the perception of the length of time that people might actually need to recover from this has been skewed. It's partly been skewed by the fact that um, they've not gone into hospital and therefore they perceive that they might have a milder version of, uh, of COVID. Um, but, um, and this is uh, something that you mentioned, Vincent, that there's no necessarily a physical manifestation of this, that people might perceive that actually, you know, um, they're back to normal because they, they look like they did previously. Um, how, 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 how might people start to shift their perception about what's acceptable, particularly if, 
others around them say, shouldn't you be better by now? Shouldn't you be going to work by now? Um, what, what are people's thoughts on that? Uh, should I field that one or one aspect of it anyway? I, uh, I think what is interesting uh, about the, the emerging picture of long COVID is, is partly that it is emerging. We do not know the path of this yet. And it does seem to have, certainly in people that I know, and I know a couple of friends who are having periods of relative normality and it doesn't look like they're pushing themselves too hard but they're then having a recurrence of symptoms and my uh, a, a close relative of mine had an, an ongoing fever uh, very low grade but for about two months afterwards so we really don't know and i think that's what you tell the people around you you a take your own feelings uh, seriously and your own symptoms seriously you, you're feeling like you're feeling there's no should about it if you're feeling tired feverish if you, you can do stuff one day and you can't the next that's just the truth of it so again it's about uh taking your own symptoms seriously and communicating that to people around you and uh i think in a way i i think people are being a bit more understanding of this Quite a few of us I work with in clinic who are fatigued for other reasons have said people around them have become a bit more understanding of their condition because they see loads of people are now struggling with with fatigue and with managing uh, constrained circumstances. So, uh, yeah, I think you just need to fess up and tell people how you're really feeling. Julia, did you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, one of the things, um, you know, we find in the clinic when we see people who've got fatigue who are post cancer patients um, is this feeling of guilt that people who've um, had cancer their cancer has been cured but they still feel awful with fatigue and they feel that society their family their friends sometimes their doctors expect them to be doing more and to be grateful because they are cured from their cancer so I think this is that the experiences that we've had from those kind of patient groups apply to the long COVID patients. It's it's a case of people's expectations can sometimes influence how you feel, and that guilt that you're not feeling better. You're one of the lucky ones because you didn't go into hospital and um, have that horrible experience. You're therefore supposed to do better and do more. But the reality is, as Vincent said, we don't understand the natural history of this condition. And un until we do, it's about saying how you feel and, and society believing you um, and us making sure that we take people's symptoms seriously. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what, uh, perhaps uh, the, the final, um, question is that one, one of the potential mechanisms um, relates to um, the inflammatory response uh, within the immune system and uh, um, you know you, you talked about the different pathways and the, the sort of um, uh, cytokinines and the, and the um, cytokinine storm that's been referenced within the context of COVID. Um, in terms of managing that, that process in terms of our behaviours is there any kind of for the inflammatory um, uh, driven diseases that you're aware of what works particularly well in terms of uh, managing fatigue is there anything that you would um, highlight that people might want to uh, consider here so the the one area that we do focus on in the clinic uh, which is um, the autonomic nervous system we know that that can um, sometimes be that's one of the common things that we find across all different groups that people, if they're dizzy when they stand up or they have episodes of loss of consciousness, that makes us suspect that their volume in their system is um, perhaps not as filled as it would ideally be. So we really focus on encouraging people to drink at least two and a half litres of non-caffeinated fluid a day. Um, so that's a simple thing that people can do. Make sure that they don't have too much caffeine because that pushes your... A, you know towards the sympathetic adrenaline orientated part um, but actually making sure that you've got
got enough volume in your circulation and it sounds really easy to drink that amount of water but it's actually really hard um, so you know focusing on that is a good thing to do um, and something that we always encourage people to do in clinic yeah that's, that's really helpful it's, it's those practical behaviors isn't it that, um, mm. that are often the most effective um, you know having a, um, a two liter bottle that you try and yeah. carry around and remove from the start of the day to the end of the day and filling it up in the morning and uh, as a routine and um, and such like um are there any uh, kate yeah just to um, follow up from that as well i mean we work with people who have um inflammatory disease you know um quite a f i mentioned quite a few um, patients that come through from the rheumatology clinic so you know with rheumatoid arthritis psoriatic arthritis um, Sjogren syndrome etc and and some of the strategies and the techniques that we use um, there is some evidence that they do um, reduce the impact of fatigue in people with rheumatoid arthritis so a different you know a a different condition um, but there is an inflammatory process going on um, so really I think we're just taking what we know from other conditions um, and what helps and and just wondering you know and actually wondering if we can apply some of those techniques um, to people that are experiencing um, symptoms of COVID um, or fatigue symptoms of COVID in the longer term yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and a lot of those I mean the thing I keep coming back to is this idea about establishing the new normal this mm -hmm. idea about what is your baseline um, yeah. with a, a frame of reference that says actually you know you do need to be your own best friend you need to recognize about the internal narrative as much as the behaviors that you are engaging with um, and then I really like the idea of um, the planning but also the prioritization of things that give you pleasure as well during the day um, mm -hmm. And it's not something that um, I've heard much about in the rehabilitation narrative. It's all been, yes, let's you know, make sure that you plan and that you pace and that things are slow. But for people to start to think about where am I getting a sense of joy um, yeah. as part of my rehabilitation. And actually, that's OK. It's OK to try and seek joy and, um, and, and things that I enjoy doing um, mm -hmm. and giving yourself permission to, to do that as part of your recovery. It doesn't all, all have to be that sort of negative narrative, I think perhaps might be quite um, both challenging, but also releasing for, for people in the way that they, they view their recovery. So um, uh, thank you for your investment uh, this evening and the time preparing for this. Um, uh, I, I very much appreciate it. And um, I'm sure that people will find uh, the content really helpful. So thank you.